guys, it is May 10th and another red day in the markets. Lots of fun. Um, all right, I'm going to share the screen. As we always mention, past performance is not indicative of future returns. So we always want to be very careful to say that. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting. This market is red, red, green, red. And NASDAQ, I think, has started out the morning very weak. And, uh, you know, the whole market tried to rally. And I always remind people that most of the traders in the mor morning are either day traders or they're European traders. And the look in Europe is a little bit different from the look in America. Remember, I've mentioned before that Europe looks way worse than America does. And so it kind of makes sense that they are day trading our market with all kinds of thought processes surrounding it. Um, I really want to, you know, what I have prepared today is very limited, but I want to show you, like, this is, again, what the market looks like. It, oh my goodness. All right. Advertisements, Finviz, one of my favorite um, uh, visualizations out there. This is what the market looks like today. You've got um, Apple, Microsoft, Google, which is most of what NASDAQ is, um, holding up the entire support of things. And then you've got Tesla and Amazon kind of going back and forth on the red. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of Amazon because I think they really shouldn't get credit for anything until the following quarter. Where it falls is anyone's best guess there. Um, but that's how the market looks today. It's actually, in my opinion, somewhat mixed. And you don't have yet energy rallying, in my opinion, the way it should, because it really had a very strong quarter. They are not adding capacity on because they're not falling for it, is really the way that they're putting it. If I was to summarize how to think about their call, their earnings calls this quarter, um, I want to kind of show you um, tomorrow we have CPI. We know that's going to come out kind of high. I mean, are we confused that the inflation numbers are what the inflation numbers are? So I think you know, by the end of today, you still have people probably setting up a little scared in front of that number. And then after that, it's hard to say, we're kind of more or less out of earnings season within big cap. If you go on to like earnings whisper, we've got Occidental Petroleum reporting like right now, um, they're going to be just fine. Um, even if they report something strange, even when some of these companies are reporting in theory worse than expected, like I saw some earnings release that Apache reported earnings like that was worse than expected. It's complete nonsense. Okay. They reported 80% top line growth, 400 or 500%. Like it's just the most ridiculous statement around. Um, and I will show you that here's Apache. And they're where they're looking at their energy cost, right? So basically their average oil price per barrel is 102 versus what it was last quarter. So if you messed up as an analyst and thought they somehow hedged out at 117, that's on you. That's not like this thing is still trading more only a little bit above. Like, you know, if you look at the charts on these, even if they were doubles, they were undervalued here. So like, this is nonsensical. Um, and by the way, Apache is not going to be drilling in the U.S. anymore because they can get better prices in, uh, from, from Egypt and then trying to sell it over to Europe. So it's not even like they're kind of thinking they'll make money. All of them are going to make a ton of money. So it's, it's kind of a joke in oil and gas. Every time I think every time the market gets weak, start accumulating. Um, I really don't have another way to say it. And especially if you've got, a, you know, somebody was talking to me the other day that yesterday they were in a margin account and they were like, what do you think about selling calls to acquire the stock that way? Or sorry, selling puts to acquire the stock that way. And that's a legit thing if you have the cash for it. I don't think you should do it if you're just doing it from a leverage perspective to try to day trade it. I think that's really dangerous. But given that vol is at an all time high, if you're trying to like, let's say Apache or let's just even say the XLE, okay? So the XLE right now has ball that's outsized relative to what it is. So if you just were like, you know what? I would buy the XLE at 75. You could probably sell XLE puts at like 70 cents and you would recreate it at 75. So definitely if you have enough cash in your account or alternatively you have a margin account that just lets you do it and you wanted to buy stock that way, do it. I mean, especially in oil and gas, some of these things, look, this is a 4% dividend yield and the dynamics in this market are multi-year positive that direction. So that's ridiculous. We still have the long end of the curve under 3%. So, you know, by all means, knock yourself out. Um, the only other thing I really have prepared for today is I wanted to show you, you know, I listen to these calls 
myself. Okay. This isn't me like guessing what was said on the call. This is me reviewing the calls, reviewing the news release, the 10 Qs, which sometimes is different from the news release and then their deck. Cause that's what most of these companies put out. Some, some companies do not put out a presentation. Some companies, their news release is so worthless. I just skip it and read it so fast that I'm really just reading the queue at that point. And then some, the queue and the news release are identical. So that's kind of how it all falls out for documentation. Then a few of them have supplements, but doesn't matter. I have reviewed 202 at this point, probably a little more than that because I took this this morning. This is how it all lays out. Now I got 12 companies that are really not doing great. And they are not companies that are, that are like puking it out on the stock as much as you would think. So there's plenty of shorts out there. So, so to me, you only get a little party hat if you actually had top line and you carried all that down to earnings. And what I mean by that is I want to see margin expansion, not just, oh, you had top line growth of 10%, 15%. You had bottom line growth of 10 to 15%. I need to see that it carried through operating income and not some funky thing that you did in between operating income and earnings to make that number work. And I still have 34 companies that look like that. And let me tell you, a lot of those are energy companies. <laughs> I mean, some of them are also like Robert Half, which has been clobbered and it's going to continue to get clobbered because everybody's thematically just selling things that are thinking that GDP growth is not going to happen. But I'm going to tell you, people are still having difficulty finding people. And that company actually did a lot to improve their operating leverage. So there's that. And by the way, one of their biggest business is accounting, accounting temps. And accounting temps are in demand right now because we keep changing the tax laws. So there's a lot of extra, there's a lot of extra work for them. So they're doing just fine. And then there's a lot of other names that are in there that are doing great. Um, these companies right here with the thumbs up for me, those are companies that um, had, you know, high single digits to almost double digits, uh, low double digits, like low teens, um, top line growth quarter, year over year on the quarter. And then they also maybe were more or less just brought it straight down to earnings or alternatively, there was a little bit of something in there. So like maybe you had like 10% top line growth, 8%. I'm gonna give it to you in this, in this crazy inflationary environment. Then you got a bunch of companies where I don't even know what's going on there. Like not, I don't know what's going on there. I obviously listened to call, read the stuff, but I'm just like, whoa, this could go either way for you right now. You're barely managing inflation or alternatively, you're telling me you're going to manage inflation and I can't tell that it's true. I'm going to need to see another quarter. Most companies look like that to me right now. And then you got a bunch of companies where I'm like, boy, I don't know if I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt because you had like top line growth of like 10, 15%, but you were flat on your operating margins, meaning you worked a whole lot harder to make the same amount of money. But at the same time, inflation's crazy. And you just told me that you're sure you got a handle on it such that I'm going to see some leverage in the future. Anyways, this is how it lays out. And I'm just going to tell you that relative to previous quarters, this is the lowest it's been since COVID has started on where people are thinking and, and, and how many companies, this is like a little bit over 50. Uh, well, we are, you know, you can, you can do the math there. So, so it is not necessarily the prettiest and you can kind of see that I haven't yet done very much. Discretionary usually has like 50 something companies in it. Staples, you know, the place that I've really done the most is really industrial, which I still have about 20 companies to go there and so on and so forth. So it's not the greatest quarter guys. So it's not surprising to me that people are gonna sell in May and, and go away. It's also gonna be the case given what I'm seeing, that you're going to have a lot more dispersion and differentiation. Um, and it's going to be worth it for the first time in a really long time to be a fundamental analyst. Because I got to tell you, some of the analysis I'm seeing that, would that yeah, you can get away with it in a, bear, in a bull market, a trending bull market, but you can't pretend like Amazon is doing well <laughs> in a market where you've got real winners and real losers. So, come on. So this is going to be very interesting. I also will argue that you cannot compare to fact set. It's the most ridiculous thing that I'm seeing happening as a trend, right? And the reason I say that is because you got a company like Clorox that beat estimates, but it had top line growth and single digits, bottom line operating margins that were crapola, like for lack of a better way to describe it. They, you know, so even though they beat the estimate, they're losing money and they still got a three. I mean, yeah, they have a 3% dividend yield. I feel you. And they probably are going to be fine to pay it, 
But why would you pay 30 times earnings for a company that has already told you they got they need another quarter to fix it? Why wouldn't you just pay 30 times earnings for a company that's already got it fixed? It's just ridiculous. So we still have a lot of that going on and this whole like beat company estimates nonsense at some point. I don't know how long that that road is going to be, but it's got to end at some point because it's ridiculous. Anyway. That's all I really have prepared for today. There aren't any other big themes that I would say because each company is really reporting the specificity of what its market environment is and what's going on. So let me just go to questions. What's going on? Uh, hey, man, you've been spot on Amazon since yeah. 3,400. Um, let me say that again. You've been spot on Amazon <laughs> since 3,400. It's now 2,165. And I hear people still recommending it, saying yeah. you're virtually, you, not virtually, you, you're getting the retail for free if you buy it at this price. Do you, do you understand what they're saying? Yeah, because you know what they're trying to say is that at this market cap, that's what the cloud business would be if they spin it out. Now, if they spin it out, you got a broken down retail business is what you have, right? Because you had 7% top line growth. You had 50, you had margins cut by 50% again, again, right? So you had a cash flow negative business is what you have, right? All right. Yeah, you're getting it for free, but what's that? What, what does that exactly mean? Do you know what I mean? So like if it, it, so what I saw from the analysis is that, and in fairness, this is at 2,700, right? So you got 600 points less. So at 600 points, so it depends what you're willing to value the Amazon Web Services business as a standalone. Do you know what I mean? Right. And if you value that at about 800 million, which is what it was valued when Microsoft, if you compared it to Microsoft's business, then I do think that Dan Loeb and the team were a little bit high on their estimates, unless they were thinking more that was a one-year target or something like that, in which case that's, a bit, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Growth is pretty aggressive in, in the Web Services business. Um, in the cloud business in general. So it's hard to say if how, what he meant exactly. And I think that the press is ruthless sometimes when they quote people. So I'm not gonna be saying that they were wrong. So then you're left with this business and you know the way that they're gonna spin it out is they've gotta spin it out in a way that doesn't cripple the core business or else you're gonna have shareholders pissed, right? <laughs> like there's no way to do that. So what exactly do they do on the structuring? I don't know the answer to that. But the core business, so Amazon grew at 7%, but the cloud business grew top line at like the, the revenues on it grew at like 40%. So what's that means happening in the rest of the business? I don't know the answer to that either. And then you've got this other kind of mess where Amazon itself is a customer of Amazon Web Services. So you got some of that to kind of go through. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then you've got this really weird bear market here. So that's kind of another thing to take into consideration. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of an unknown that I don't know if people are fully considering is just, um, you know, like um, these numbers kind of get buried in a funky way um, in the sense that like with Microsoft, the way they do their cutoffs and everything, they made it even cleaner this last quarter. You can see more cleanly what exactly it is, is that web business separated by itself. So if you were to take it out of Microsoft, it'd be really straightforward. Additionally, um, you know, very clean, like margins wise, like how is it baked into other things, that sort of thing, right? Um, like, what's it gonna look like to sellers on Amazon, the business, when you take the web services piece out? Like, how's it all look exactly? I think that's a little bit less clean in the Amazon numbers. And additionally, we all know that Microsoft is charging more. You know what I mean? By definition, it's enterprise business. So they're going to be charging you a lot more than they're charging um, uh, consumers or individuals or even smaller shops. So I think that they're, I, I just don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm not heavily shorting it here, to be honest with you. I was shorting it. You know where I was shorting at 3,400. I was happy. 3,200, I was happy. Down here, um, you know, it, every time it crops its little baby head up, I'll, I'll hit it down a little bit because I don't think it should trade more expensive than Google and Microsoft should, you know, um, but it's a pure valuation at that point. Yeah, the people I talk to uh, here in uh, Silicon Valley is Microsoft gets all the government business. Yeah, 
I mean, that's true. They're really, I mean, in fairness, they really are competing aggressively with each other. You know, Google, I, I mentioned Google's cloud business and I, people laugh at me and that's fair. <laughs> like, I'll give it to them. But in fairness, Google has other stuff going for it. So it doesn't need that cloud business to actually be crushing it. If anything, I think people should take, with Google, I think people should take a closer look at what's going on with YouTube relative to, I mean, you know, if you want to pretend like Netflix is worth something, then why aren't you pretending YouTube is worth something more? Because it looks like Netflix is going to become YouTube. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. You know, there's movies now on YouTube. Oh no, no! I think YouTube's got a you know, great upside. Yeah, but like you know, that's fair. That cloud business, you can move it to the left. It's really Amazon versus Microsoft on on that competitive front. There might be some smaller players, but let's be honest, it's really those two. If we're gonna, you know, with with the lion's share of it. So, but is there is there any way to value the just the cloud business on a per share basis? I mean, you could, you just basically try to say that whatever it's worth in Microsoft, cutting the Microsoft piece out is what the, the, the Amazon piece is worth. Let me take a second look at it. Before, I thought the street was trying to say that it was two times bigger than Microsoft's business, even though Microsoft's business does almost identical revenue to the Amazon Web Services business. But uh, maybe that's changed. I haven't, take, I haven't done that comparison since the last earnings season. I'll take a look. Um, but my suspicion is given how much both of them have traded, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Wow, are you trying to figure out where to cover? <laughs> yeah. no, you I'm got diamond of, hands on I'm these shorts. I give you credit. <laughs> really out of it, but you know, it's um, there, there's something I'm not seeing that these analysts are. I'm like, where are they coming from? Yeah, I don't know what it is. They just really like Amazon. I mean, that retail want. business is so bad right now. But you know, everybody's, like, I did review it after somebody said something to me. Um, is it that people are just, I think you you might have been the one that said it to me. I'll give you full credit. Um, about people just shopping not online anymore. And it's weird because, you know, the, the, the bricks and mortars folks are all reporting really strong growth in their online business, but the online stores, some of them did okay. Like some of them actually showed top line growth and it was just, they couldn't, all the things they had to have to do in CapEx to just compete with one another was so overwhelming. But then you have Amazon, which did not show top line growth by definition, because they only had 7% top line growth in the web business, which is a third <laughs> grew at 40%, but only eked out seven. Then you know what happened to the rest of the number. You don't even have to look at that point. Um, so, so there are some real winners and losers out there, um, and it's interesting. I, I hear now they're closing warehouses. Amazon? Yeah. Interesting. Well, they expanded during the pandemic. It's not their fault, but I mean. They must be closing them with the smaller players because Prologis is still seeing really good numbers from Amazon. That, that said, Prologis is also diversified away from Amazon as well. They only used to be like a huge component of their business. And then in the last two years, they've just like, you know, really worked hard to diversify. I think it's not only like single digits, whereas it was not single digits before. <laughs> it was very much so not single digits at the beginning of the pandemic. I don't remember the exact number, but I, I want to say it was in the 20s or something. What I'm seeing, maybe AWS is not that good. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, it's, I'm not, I'm not yet willing to go that far. Um, AWS is still definitely growing hardcore. And in general, the cloud business for a lot of different companies, even I think even IBM technically has what you would still call a cloud business. And they were seeing really strong growth as well. And, and then oddly enough, the data center business on the chip side was doing really so, so I think to the extent that you want to think about the data center business along with the cloud business, along with just that whole transition, uh, to the extent that you want to take that whole grouping together, because technically they are really different parts, but because they kind of build upon each other, you kind of should take, the, I mean, I'm going to argue you should take them together. I'm sure just as soon as I say that, somebody's going to put something in my YouTube comments about how ignorant I am, but that's fine. It's fine. You can't be perfect at all times. But when I look at that, that this quarter, whereas I think the data centers piece of it had actually been weak. Um, the data center's piece of it, particularly on the semi side, was really strong, which told me that the demand pull through is coming from different places, which should mean that the cloud business in general, as you know, from a multi quarter perspective, is still super strong. And I think that's just being driven by the fact that as much as people are going back to office, this hybrid thing is a real thing. Additionally, I think because US labor has just been so good. 
Um, and because a lot of the new kind of usage of AI has just taken up so much more computing power, um, all of that bodes well for the entire stuffs, so to speak. Um, so it's hard for me to be like, this guy's a winner, this guy's a loser, this guy's a winner, this guy's a loser, because even the losers did okay this last quarter. Gotcha. Well, I mean, you just can't take away from spending an hour at Walmart, you know? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> You can't take away from the joy of spending an hour at Walmart. Like, I'm going to tell you what's interesting is if we get a really hot summer, you know, one of the ways that folks get like, they don't have any money, if don't they don't have any money, they'll go to Walmart. <laughs> it's a real thing. Really? <laughs> yeah. There's not a Walmart in New York, is there? No, no, not in New York. In New York, we actually set up cooling centers. So like all the, and it'll be interesting to see how they do it this year. Last year, they struggled because of COVID. So they got, we got lucky because the temperatures weren't out of control, out of control. But usually what they do here in New York is the libraries open up and become cooling centers. Because the temperatures in New York, we are technically an island. I like to remind people. <laughs> We're like the Caribbean floated up to the north so that you can get some winter. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm freezing my tail off the in the winter. Water's like, not quite oh. as clear. What's that? Water's not quite as clear. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But we are an island, so we get the humidity. And so we do end up with temperatures that are well in the, once it gets into the 90s, that could actually, um, once you have all the cement and stuff like that, it could actually, you know, we get some deaths, particularly among the older, older population. So New York is one of those cities that has to set up cooling stations and what they usually do is the New York Public Library opens up to folks that just don't have access to anything that will cool them off. Um, and that ends up being a major area for people to cool off. Um, you know, good people will shop while they're cooling off. So a lot of poor people in the South, I'm just saying this is what it is. Um, you know, they, they'll go to a Walmart and hang out while the, the temperatures are the hottest. And that just ends up being the way it works. Um, so if we end up with energy bills like crazy. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you end up with a lot more foot traffic. In <laughs> I try yeah. to keep it real on this show, okay? Walmart looks good, um, technically. It looks like it's broken up. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I got to look at Walmart. Walmart is a late reporter, but they actually did a decent. So they reported January uh, no, 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 no. Sorry. Sorry. They reported, they report late for me, but early for others, depending on how you look at it. So they, and technically I have to see, I haven't listened to their most recent coming up report yet. I think they just haven't reported yet. Let me take a look, but, um, they did really well, um, in, in the previous quarter in the United States. Now they had their international business was worthless, but, um, everybody's international business is a little bit worthless. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they do. Target is actually the one that I think people aren't giving enough love to. Target and Tractor Supply. Tractor Supply, although it did not do as well as it has done in previous quarters, Tractor Supply has been a little machine. I mean, that's a really good company management team. I'm not going to lie on that. But Tractor Supply, in fairness, trades expensive. So every now and then it comes for sale. Okay. But I mean, you talk about Walmart. I mean, is their online business good? Is it efficient? that's the thing they bought um they bought Flipkart out of india thinking that they would get those programmers to work it out for them and i gotta tell you they just haven't been able to work it out uh the way that i would have wanted them to relative to all their competitors their e their e-commerce growth during covid was the worst 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 in my opinion relative to what it could have should have been okay and i can't figure out why um other than maybe they just um they're bigger than others or, or their SKUs are different. I don't know what it is they're doing. I would love to probably be smarter about it. And hopefully over the years, I'll get to meet every single one of these companies and become a true nerd. But they just, to me, I, that story always breaks my heart. Where they actually make their money is actually the same place Costco makes their money. It's because people are doing less trips. And so Sam's Club actually was really strong. Um, and and uh, that's been helping them out a lot. Because the regular Walmart store, it's doing like single digit comps. You know, I think it did uh, it did fine, low single digits, you know, versus like Target, it's crazy. Like those comps don't seem to be able to do anything but post a double digit comp like this or, or high single digits comp, you know, but whatever it does, it does crazy good numbers. TJ Maxx, same thing. All of the discounters are doing great. You know, online business, TJ Maxx doesn't have much of one, but Walmart, it's really, it, it's saving grace is really the Sam's Club. 
Now it's been a while since I looked at him, so I apologize. That's why I'm not being precise with my numbers in case you're watching this on YouTube and are like, that's not right. Please go ahead and post in the comments is right. Fine. I'm sorry, but but yeah, it's really Sam Club that does it for, for Walmart every time. Whereas with now the in comparison, if you compare it to Target, Target's actually doing a lot of real clever things with its um with its with its online e-commerce sales in the sense that like it's trying to get people to order online. It's got it's doing a lot more and having success with it. Whereas I'm not seeing that with Walmart and trying to get people to add stuff to their cart. And then when they drive up, they're like trying to figure out different ways to make that um, a shopping a part of the shopping experience. And they're getting bigger average basket size. They're doing all like their their conversation always on the e-commerce size is far more extended than what I'm hearing from Walmart. Walmart's really, Walmart too as well had some inventory issues that didn't like Target, TJ Maxx. And I know Target and TJ Maxx are such different businesses from Walmart, but really it's about shopping if you're poor is really what to me all of that stuff is. If we're really honest, you know, if you're, if you're at Target, you're, you're poor and fabulous. If you're going to Walmart, you're like poor and unabashedly cool with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, I shop at both. So I'm not even, you know, whatever, you know, if you're a TJ Maxx, you're definitely poor and fabulous. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's fine. But these are all the stores that you would expect to have a, a good time and be fine. Yeah, through kind of very, it's very interesting what you said about Sam's Club because that's Costco, right? That's Walmart. Yes. Costco's, Costco. Costco's, Costco's doing great. Costco's doing great. Yeah. Okay. Lee, so Walmart Lee, Lee, always Costco. has a, yeah. Okay, go ahead. No, no, you're totally right. I was just getting excited. <laughs> yeah, if they do something with Sam's, then it becomes even more valuable. I don't yeah, think, I don't know. I don't think I don't Sam's know on the level of Costco. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they do with it. It, it, it. They show membership fees there as a line item. It always looks good. Same thing with Costco. They show the membership fees line item. People are definitely interested in that, especially with all the concerns on inflation, all of that stuff. They are net beneficiaries as retailers. Um, are they like amazing? It's, it's a really, uh, um, you know, this retail environment is about how well are you managing your inventory even more so than it is about, I'll tell you the one that's a sleeper that I'm really watching, but I'm not ready to buy it yet. Home Depot and Lowe's. I'm going to tell you why. Um, I've gone through a few, but I think I've gone through most of the, um, industrial companies that produce home goods items. Like a lot of people forget fortune brands and Masco and all those there. Uh, Masco actually is in, wait, I think Masco might be consumer discretionary, but there's a few of the, um, a few of the um, home goods type things that are actually gicked uh, or classified in industrials. And most of them are still reporting very strong numbers, getting inflation right on through there, shoving it right on through to the consumer, <laughs> ouch, right? Fortune Brands also does like lawn, like patio furniture and stuff like that. They had a cabinets business, which I think is why um, they just sold it, all that stuff, whatever. Anyways, those guys are still getting really good numbers, showing really strong growth. They're, they're still not worried about demand. They're more worried about supply and, and everything like that. Lowe's and Home Depot have gotten clobbered and then you've got housing starts. And everybody's like, oh, housing starts are such crap, la, 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 la. But you've actually got a lot of the home builders still reporting really good numbers. You still have like um, a lot of like, the real estate investment trusts are getting their rents all the way through. The apartment REITs are not having a problem. And, um, you know, it, it's true. Like if you're going to have asset class rotation versus just asset industry rotation, real estate is still a place people go for inflation, even in a rising rate environment, <laughs> because it just turns out that one of the things that inflates labor cost, raw material cost, et cetera, means that your house might be worth more. It's, and, and we have this bizarre dynamic in the United States where um, where we have a housing, uh, we, we, did, we underbuilt for the last 10 years because 2008 was such a disaster for everyone. So, so it's possible that Home Depot and Lowe's getting sold off so aggressively. I'm gonna be watching that very closely, um, but we got a little bit for reports earnings. So that could be very interesting. And maybe that's a better one for those guys that don't want to hang out in Walmart all day. I know plenty of guys that can hang out at Home Depot for hours. So you know, even I can hang out at Home Depot for hours. I really enjoy it. <laughs> Be my guest. You know what? Starbucks ought to consider putting a Home Depot. You know what I mean? <laughs> for every woman who's dragged her man to the Home Depot. Let me tell you. <laughs> anyway. 
So That's in your opinion, okay, overall market, the, the consumer is strong, right? Consumers still doing okay for the most part. I mean, the one place where, um, and, and I'm going to tell you, I just covered my short on it. It was a very short-term short. I was short Carvana because Carvana, um, the way that they do their loans absolutely is subprime looking. You know, they'll, they'll do a seven-year loan. I was trying to figure out where am I going to start to see uh, the consumer show weakness. And so I'll probably be short Carvana from time to time. I'm caref carefully so because, you know, it's an aggressive management team and it has a lot of people that love it. But... Um, the consumer so far has shown pretty well in the United States of America, okay? Overseas, all bets are off. I can't really speak to that. But in the US, we're still seeing savings accounts at all time highs, like savings are fairly strong for the individual. We're seeing people pay off their credit debt very quickly still. So you're, you're, uh, the, uh, the CLO space itself is still like um, lacking loans to securitize and roll out, you know, so the street would love to see more people actually do a little bit more there. Quite frankly, you're still seeing, um, you're still seeing um, very high, um, you're still seeing very low credit losses. And uh, most banks have had to release some of the reserves for credit losses, uh, just because it's prudent to do so right now. I mean, what are you really holding it for at this point? You're still seeing high, um, high amounts of uh, or low amounts of uh, employment issues and people still feel like they can get a job. So everything is pointing towards a consumer that is healthy, um, whether or not that, now the interesting thing too, that's just helping a lot of the retail space, which is part of the reason why I'm so irritated with Amazon, to be honest, because I, I don't like to see companies do poorly, but I hate it when you post a nasty quarter. It's just like, why? I'm so upset when I see that. My, maybe this is why this is the right role for me, <laughs> right? Because I really do see it like Netflix, you know, but like a lot of companies and retail are making the top line growth just off of inflation. I mean, let's call it what it is. You got 7% inflation. I ought to see 7% top line growth. I'm just saying, unless there's something wrong with the consumer. Like, let's just keep it simple, right? You know, um, yeah. So, so, and it turns out that's what I saw, you know, even among the grocery stores. So then it's just whether or not you manage your costs appropriately and you have a big prices through, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, you know, I don't know if that's helpful. No, of course it is. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that consumer strong. Yeah. If inflation starts to come down, then that's the consumer's not going to get weak all of a sudden. No, so, no, it's just then then we have a rise in rate environment that's probably going to have to be addressed fairly aggressively. No, no, no. If inflation starts coming down. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You're right. You're right. My bad. I didn't understand. Yeah. If we got, then we'd have like the perfect, we have like 1999. That's what we have. That's what that is. You have like lots of people with jobs and the market goes crazy. Yeah, that's, that's true. So are you thinking 99 as a scenario? How are you thinking about it? Well, yeah, I'm just thinking what, what is happening is you, you have a very strong uh, consumer and the inflation that is probably coming down and the stock market come down, came down because of multiples, which I understand. Yeah. So now stuff is attractive. I think stuff is definitely attractive for the companies that are absolutely crushing it. I think, I think the market's very attractive. I mean, hold on. Can't show you my spreadsheet because I, sometimes I write things in my notes that aren't very nice. If I get very frustrated, <laughs> <laughs> like, so I, don't, I would never want anyone to see that and be like, never talk to her again. She's a horrible human being. But like, you definitely had some companies that really, really crushed it. I mean, obviously, with energy, you had things like Devin. Uh, top line growth up 85%, bottom line growth up 464%, paying down debt, giving you a dividend. Um, but even with like um, Darden restaurants, right? Like that's your Olive Garden, I think, right? I think, I think Darden's all Olive Garden. 21% um, top line growth, 59% bottom line growth. Now in fairness, people be like, but May, come on, that's relative to COVID. <laughs> That's a fair point, but still, that's a legit strong set of numbers. You know, um, that's despite the fact that they got to manage labor costs, they got food costs going up, all these things are happening to them. Um, but people are spending Mastercard, um, Visa, crushing it. And you know, if you don't have the inflation issue and you still got people with jobs, then what you have is a lot of people willing to spend money. So the volume transaction growth is going to increase. 
um, you know, and, and so that's just nothing but benefit because they make money off of transaction volume. Um, you got um, Robert Half already mentioned, uh, Mosaic, you know how I feel about that. And if, if people are going to be making money and you've got good GDP growth, then farmers aren't going to be so sensitive to spending money on fertilizer, even in the United States. Like I think right now, the confusion for people is whether or not the farmer is going to get all that trickle down from the grain crop being what it is, and whether or not he's therefore then going to spend on fertilizer versus trying to come up with some other way to do it or whatever, or I don't even know. I think the farmer, if he makes money, will do whatever it takes to make more crops because I think farmers aren't dumb. And I think they know that there's no grain out there. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? That's just my, just one lady's opinion, but um, you know, they did great. Um, then you've got the stimulus bill at the end of the year on the industrial side, which is going to create more jobs. Cause that hasn't really baked in yet. Um, I don't know. I like I like the way you see the world, though. I will give you that. <laughs> I mean, I think I think there's a real narrow path for the plane to fly down. And I mean, you know, as much as people want to criticize uh, Jerome Powell for being delayed on the use of the word transitory, which I think is really unfair. It's super unfair to him. Um, I do think that there's a real way for us to navigate through to it. Yeah, Cleveland Cliffs it really looks. I mean, it's come off from 34, it's now 22. I don't do Cleveland Cliffs. Um, they're steel. Are they steel or what? They're um, infra inf infrastructure. Okay, I don't know them very well. They're outside of my realm. I'll take a look though, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, could be good. It really could go either way, couldn't it? <laughs> Well, it's already gone down, I mean, a lot. Yeah. What are you buying? Are uh, you buying or are you going to wait? No, I'm, I added to Devin yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Devin is 7%. Covered, covered short Amazon, which is big. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I think Clean Cliffs would be a good good purchase. CLF. I'll take a look. Um, is the model telling you that? Yeah. All right, I have to do some work on that then. That's interesting. Um, the, um, yeah, what am I doing? I, I definitely did some Devin too, because that's 7% dividend yield's a joke. You know, even if you just have that and just like let the cash run off of it, you know, to pay for other stuff, 7% right. is no joke. And they're only going to raise that dividend yield because they're not, not, a, not one oil company was like, oh, we're going to do a stupid amount of CapEx and just start milking the, you know, not one. Um, I did add to some, all right, I got rid of, like I had them set up as put spreads or call spreads, sorry, call spreads. So I got, I did get rid of one leg, one leg of that. So it's just a call now for, um, for console energy, this, the, um, the, um, the coal company, the thermal coal. Now, in fairness, Met Coal is doing just as well as Thermal Coal. So, I, whereas before I was like, eh, I understand Thermal Coal a little better than I do Metallurgical Coal for the making of steel, essentially. I think both of them are going to do okay. Um, so, so there um, with Thermal Coal, um, I just don't know. Given that all, none of the oil companies are going to overproduce, and they were saying as well that um, they just felt like the inventory that uh, the utilities companies on the East Coast have are just lower than they ought to be. So any spot coal that was coming up for sale, people were immediately buying it. So it's just about how fast can they pull it out of the ground in a way that doesn't kill people, for lack of a better way to describe, because you are talking about coal mine in here, right? Um, so there's that. And also I think because the rails had reported some, like every single quarter, it's all about whether the rails move faster or slower. You know what I mean? Um, they're happy to put more carriages onto the rail, uh, onto a little choo-choo train, for lack of a better way to describe it. But it's still got to get from point A to point B in a manner that makes sense. And I think um, because of the location, locationally where console is, I think it actually did better than Peabody, uh, BTU, ticker BTU. Um, so there's that as well, which is why I just feel a little easier about that one. Yeah, yeah, we, we were, we were short a bunch. We're short of the S&P, long the Vegas, blah, blah, blah. But we're yeah. now 
this long, period. Yeah, that's probably right. I mean, I think it's going to be shaky, though, through next week. Because I think, you know, if you think about my issue, since because, you know, some people actually, it was nice. We were getting some comments on the YouTube channel about, like, what do you think about Mosaic? What do you think? I mean, of course, I'm so bullish Mosaic. I think you can recreate it lower, though, using options. So I'd rather sell puts to, to own it, which some people may be like, that's messed up, may just buy it like a normal human being. But you can sell puts. And right now, because the ball is so high, you can sell puts and recreate it you know, if you just watch the market carefully, wherever the hell you want, more or less. Um, but, um, you know, Albemarle as well is coming up for sale. So they're, I don't know, because it's kind of a funky, it's, there's so much vol in Albemarle. I think you just buy it wherever you can around here, because it's cheap at 122. It's going to get spot pricing that's significantly higher than where it's at. And EV is not going away because I think the drama from Europe is like, you got to go to EV faster. You mean 222? What's that? Yeah, we, we have call a, a call. Spread of yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the right call. I mean, um, but this market is so volatile right now. That's all I really got. <laughs> okay. All right. Good luck out there. See you guys tomorrow.